Alicia Gaza, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Some may not know your name, some may not even know your face, but almost everyone in America and around the world knows your work because you are one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. Seven years ago, George Zimmerman was acquitted for the killing of Trayvon Martin, and that sparked in you a movement and an idea that has really sparked now a movement around the world. Take me through why the George Zimmerman case was the catalyst that changed how Alicia saw politics in her life and in the world. Well, you know, I've been organizing for a long time now. It's been almost 20 years. And so I'm no stranger to police violence or police abuse. I mean, in my community, Oscar Grant was murdered by a police officer uh, just a few blocks from my home. Uh, and, in, and then, of course, in addition to that, through my organizing work in Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco, there was a young man named Kenneth Harding who was murdered in broad daylight by police for evading a $2 fare. So that's not the surprising part. But this one really struck me because George Zimmerman was not a police officer. He was a vigilante who decided that 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, who had gone to the liquor store for snacks at, during a break in a football game, didn't belong in the neighborhood that he lived in. And that hit me in my gut. I have a brother who's eight years younger than me. He's six feet tall. He's growing up in a community that's not unlike Sanford, Florida. He's the sweetest kid in the world. He's never even been in a fight. But to think that someone like him could be walking down the street and be considered a threat just because of the way he looks really just enrages me. Lots of people get involved because they are angry or upset or they're hurt. But there's something that transforms in us when we become a part of a movement that transforms it into love. We do this work because we love ourselves and our communities so much that we believe that we deserve better, and we certainly do. It feels like there's a recurring theme that goes beyond the police in America. Because the police are an issue, yes. I mean, but that's an issue that, strangely enough, is, is experienced across the globe, whether it's in South Africa or Nigeria or even in the UK. There is, there is a common thread in how police police people of a certain standing in society. What do you think that tells us about how Americans or how law enforcement or how society views a Black life? Well, I think very simply, it means that Black lives don't matter. Black lives are considered to be valuable in some contexts, right, like entertainment or culture. But when it comes to Black people being able to access the things that we need to live well, there are several barriers actually that are involved in keeping us from those things. And a lot of it has to do with white supremacy. You know, Trevor, before I got on with you tonight, uh, my, I was visited at my home by the FBI. Apparently somebody was recently arrested on a weapons charge who was affiliated with white nationalist groups. And wow. they had my name alongside a host of other activist names on a list. This is because, of course, we push so hard to make sure that black people are treated just like everybody else. We're not wow. acting, we're not organizing for a world in which black people are more powerful than anybody else. It's literally about equalizing the playing field. And so much of that has to do with power. Movements are made to put more power into the hands of more people. But when you activate movements, it is threatening to the current status quo. There are people in this country and around the world who do not want to see power distributed in this way. And that's why we fight. And this movement is so powerful because there are so many of us and it cannot be stopped. This is what makes it so threatening to the powers that be. Last night during the presidential debates, we saw that this president used our movement as a political football. What's exciting, though, this time around, is that we have a little more time and experience under our belts. And actually, I talk about the, the lie that he tried to uh, propagate last night in the book. I talk about this incident where there were protesters who were chanting pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon, and the media and the president immediately moved to try to attach it to Black Lives Matter. It's a strategy to distract, to discredit, and delegitimize something that has won hearts and minds around the world. Your book takes a fascinating look at power. I mean, the, the title, The Purpose of Power, really digs into it. You have tangible things that you talk about in the book that, yes, predominantly black people need, but funny enough, and I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, there are many poor white communities in America who've gone, 
actually, we have those same issues and we need to be fighting with Black Lives Matter for these causes. Talk me through some of the concrete steps that you think need to be taken to improve the lives of all Americans, especially people who are Black. I'm really proud of this movement. And one of the reasons that my book is not a BLM book is because our story is still being written. I'm so proud of the movement for Black Lives, which has introduced the BREATHE Act, which I consider to be our generation's version of the Civil Rights Act. That's incredible. And it represents a, a maturation and a growth of our movement. For myself, I started an organization called the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund. We work specifically to make Black communities powerful in politics. We conducted the largest survey of Black people in America in 155 years, and we learned a lot about what we experience every day, but also what we want to see for our futures. Right. We took that information and turned it into a Black agenda for 2020, which literally is a legislative roadmap for how to make Black Lives Matter from City Hall to Congress. And the number one issues that people talked about, for example, were wages that were too low to support a family, uh, right. not having access to quality and affordable health care and housing. And so that's why we invest, we invest in our communities to bring forward the solutions that we all deserve. We that are closest to the pain know a lot about what it's going to take to shift it. Elections are about policies, and that's why we organize. We don't, I don't know that I ever want to have Joe Biden over for dinner, right? That's not the point of giving him my vote. The point is to make the kind of terrain where you can get the things that you need more easily and more right. accessibly. And that's what we're organizing people around now. And I agree with you 100% that we've got to be clear about the things that we want. There's a lot of agendas out there, but not a lot of agendas that are actually rooted in organizing people who are being directly impacted by the issues that we're talking about. That has to be the new face of a movement for the 21st century. Well, I'll tell you this. I think your book is an amazing gateway into that world. Um, I was fascinated by it. I hope everybody else reads it because I think it's illuminating and it has concrete steps that I think just should be taken. So thank you so much for joining us on the show and um, congratulations on your journey. I, uh, I hope to see you again when you've made the HBO adaptation of ta Coates's book, Between the World and Me. That's going to be really exciting. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Anytime.